Welcome to the Rumi Forum. I'm Shuja Nawaz. I'm the director of the South Asia Center at the Atlantic Council of the United States. And it's my great pleasure today to introduce our guest, uh, Ambassador Wendy Chamberlain, who is the president of the Middle East Institute. Uh, Ambassador Chamberlain has a distinguished career um, which uh, encompasses postings around the world, uh, particularly in the Middle East and the, the Muslim world. Uh, she was famously ambassador at the time of uh, the crisis of 9-11 uh, in Pakistan and handled uh, very critical uh, discussions with then President Musharraf at that time. Um, after that she came back uh, and went back to the U US aid uh, and from there uh, she went to the United Nations High Commission for Refugees uh, and eventually in 2007 took over as the president of the Middle East Institute. Uh, Ambassador Chamberlain uh, obviously has been keeping uh, track of developments in uh, the, that region of the world and so appropriately today our focus of attention is on Pakistan and the title of our discussion today is Pakistan in a time of crisis. Uh, so with that uh, may I uh, introduce uh, Ambassador Chamberlain and if you would like to say something initially before we begin our conversation. Well, if I could, I think uh, an important part of, uh, I don't like to criticize you, but an important part of your introduction uh, you missed, and that is that you yourself, Sujan Nawaz, has uh, recently published one of the best books on the Pakistan military uh, that you'll find in any library, uh, Cro Cross Swords. Yes. A and I would uh, highly recommend it uh, to anybody who needs to or wants to understand Pakistan, but the important role of the of, of Pakistan military uh, in its history, I highly recommend it. Thank you for that uh, commercial, uh, Ambassador. I appreciate it. Uh, actually, the Rumi <coughs> Forum uh, had a, a session with me on, this, on the book. Excellent. So uh, many of the uh, people mm -hmm. that come here regularly may be familiar with it. Um, we are talking about the present, uh, but uh, in order to do that, maybe we should begin in the past, and that's why I mentioned 9-11. And uh, mm -hmm. obviously that is where uh, things began. Uh, and uh, we don't know where they're going to end, but uh, could you shed some light on the events uh, from your perspective on 9-11 and how you interacted with President Musharraf? Well, uh, very interesting. On, I had only been uh, in Pakistan for one month. I arrived uh, as ambassador on uh, mid-August, August 13 of uh, 2001, and I hadn't yet presented my credentials. I was scheduled to present my credentials, which is a formali diplomatic formality, on September 13. Uh, and the reason uh, for the delay is because it gets so hot in Pakistan that they don't like to um, <clears throat> bring out the horses and uh, the new ambassadors have to arrive at the palace uh, in, a, in a grand carriage so uh, we had to wait. I, I wasn't about to wait uh, and uh, in that uh, weeks leading up to the time when I would present my credentials I made a, a visit out to the uh, border of, of Afghanistan and Pakistan in Peshawar, the Jalazai holding camp. Now the reason I had done this was because we had had, uh, had gotten some uh, intelligence in, I'm, I'm, I'm telling the long story here leading up to it because it's kind of important, uh, that, uh, and I, that there would be a, uh, a famine in uh, Afghanistan that after uh, three years of serious drought, civil war, and the Taliban blocking World Food Program rice dis food distributions that the uh, reserves in Afghanistan were going to fall to the floor. And by Christmas time of 2001, our USAID experts predicted that there would be a uh, massive famine. People by the um, tens of thousands would be coming into Pakistan. And this was already beginning to happen. But the Pakistani government policy on refugees then was we've got enough We've got four million Afghans in our country. We're not taking any more. They were holding them in the Jalazai holding camp, not even a refugee camp, and threatening to push them back. So I wanted to draw some attention to what I saw as a looming humanitarian crisis, which I thought would dominate my ambassadorship. 
uh, and not to be so. But uh, I was later told uh, by some friends of mine in ISI that uh, after my trip there, which was splashed all over the Pakistan media, my first introduction to the Pakistan media with my two little girls, um, they told President Musharraf, watch out for the new ambassador, she's aggressive. <laughs> so uh, first, um, first introduction to President Musharraf is with this as background, he invited me to dinner. Uh, very graciously, uh, he and I and uh, 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 General uh, 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 what's his name, who later became ambassador here, uh, Durrani, Durrani uh, met for dinner and we talked and talked and talked until late in the evening. And President Musharraf shared his view of the of this country and where he'd like to take it, his vision. He saw domestic terrorism as the number one obstacle to developing Pakistan. The Pakistan was a victim of internal terrorism, a proxy war with the Shia funded uh, terrorist groups and madrasas and the Wahhabi funded uh, terrorist groups fighting each other. And he knew and he said that that he would never be able to break this terrorism uh, as long as uh, the Al-Qaeda problem uh, in Afghanistan uh, persisted. So, with that as background, two weeks later, when the air, airplanes crashed into the World Trade Tower, Pentagon, and crashed into Pennsylvania, um, and I was given my first instruction uh, to go into President Musharraf on September 13 and say, are you with us or, or are you against us? I knew him, and I knew how diplom <coughs> what diplomats are trained to do is to know how to get your objective uh, in the best way possible. And I knew that this was just not going to work. You don't go into a proud man and say, or threaten them. So I did carry out my instructions. I went in and I said, are you with us or are you against us? Now look, I know you're with us. I know what you want uh, for your country is uh, to, to tackle this terrorism problem while providing security on both your eastern and your western border. So, uh, General Musharraf, he was a general then, you tell me, what do you need from the United States to make this relationship work, this partnership work at this time? Um, and that's where we carried it. There were no conditionings, there was no threats, at least on my part. I was the first American to speak to him after 911, although uh, shortly after my telephone call, uh, Secretary Powell called him and they established a very close and personal relationship. You said there were no conditions, but uh, you're reported to have given him a sheet of paper with a list of the uh, demands of the United States. Uh, that was a misreport and it grieved me. I think he mischaracterized that in his own book. On uh, September 15, we began a dialogue. He was careful not to make conditions, although they were clearly understood to be conditions by me, but they were never used that word. And I went back and suggested certain things that we, terms that we would like him to consider. Uh, he took some of mine, I took some of his, um, uh, but it was a very uh, uh, productive exchange and negotiation. We got to yes very quickly. They were never demands. One of the uh, conditions or one of the Terms. agreements mm -hmm. that emerged in, in those exchanges was the uh, arrangement under which the United States offered to defray the costs of Pakistan moving its troops into Fatah. Uh, how, how did that emerge? That came much later. That didn't come until about February or March. Um, uh, uh, in, in, and in fact, um, that was a initiative taken by the Defense Department, um, Secretary of Defense Rumsfeld. Uh, it, it, what you're t what uh, uh, Susha uh, Nawaz is talking about is the um, uh, coalition support funds. Um, 
Dov Zakheim, the number three, the controller of the Defense Department, came to visit us in in about February, February, March time frame, offered a uh, an assistance package to begin a compensation package, not an assistance package, for the Pakistani um, army to compensate them for the expenditures of deploying troops along the border. Uh, we understood, and I believe Pakistani government understood all the time, that this was not uh, rent of the army, uh, nor was it um, nor was it paying the army to do uh, certain uh, operational uh, efforts over and beyond what it uh, intended to do normally. Later, that was misunderstood or understood differently uh, in the American public, and it, f quite frankly, by the, Amer the um, Bush administration, as uh, as assistance to Pakistan to do certain counterterrorism uh, operations that it normally would not have done. Pa the Pakistan Army and Musharraf always understood it to be compensation for their expen increased expenditures by de deploying from 60 to 100,000 uh, troops along the border. And this misunderstanding or this difference in views on what that uh, um, coalition support funding uh, still persists today. That's why I asked the question, Ambassador, mm -hmm. because it's, it's obviously not just a definitional issue. Um, we, we now, mm -hmm. in the recent past, have had exchanges about is this America's war or is this Pakistan's war, mm -hmm. particularly in the border region with Afghanistan. And so uh, that's why I wanted to find out exactly how it emerged, uh, because if, as you are implying, General Musharraf was prepared already to move troops into the the region that has not come across either in his book nor in any of the other utterances in Pakistan nor for that matter from the United States. I have a lot of problems with his book. His book is different from my memory of things or, or my notes. Yes. Uh, in fact by the time uh, coalition support funding was instituted uh, Pakistani troops had been there for several months. Um, I can recall a conversation when uh, General Tommy Franks of CENTCOM had come out to visit in no December uh, and we were having uh, lunch, and uh, President, then General Musharraf, said to General Franks, "What are you? What are you doing? You're right in the middle of this Tora Bora sweep. You're pushing these uh, Al Qaeda extremists uh, out of the mountains. Where do you think they're going?" He says, "We Pakistanis have 150 valleys. They're pouring through those valleys um, into the Fatah." We don't have operational control, military control, or administration control, really, uh, over this area. Never have, even under the British. What do you think is going to happen? What's your plan? Franks was silent. Uh, Musharraf offered to de deploy troops to that border. Um, asked for air support, which never came, uh, in order to do it more swiftly. Instead, the 60,000 troops went slowly. Uh, and, and I found it an extraordinary period because at that very moment there were a million Indian troops deployed on the eastern border uh, and the Indians had, were in the process of moving their nuclear weapons uh, f f with a, to a position them within a three minute uh, strike range of uh, Islamabad. So uh, at uh, a position of a great peril, uh, President Musharraf was offering to uh, to send redeploy troops from um, the east to the west, and that was that was months months before the coalition support funding was offered. Mm -hmm. Thank you for clarifying that, and and for our audience, I should say that the reason why the the Indian troops were deployed and so were Pakistani troops to the eastern border with India was because of an attack on the Indian Parliament, uh, which uh, India saw as having emerged out of support in Pakistan. So this is when they nearly came to the brink of war. Um, we could actually spend more than an hour just talking about that uh, particular period, but um, there's so much more that we would like to, to know from you. Um, looking back now uh, and looking at this uh, current situation which is emerging and the continuing debate about is this Pakistan's war or is this America's war, particularly in light of the fact that Pakistan is now facing an internal militancy. Uh, you uh, have said that General Musharraf 
even before 9-11, saw this as the <coughs> most serious threat, uh, rather than India. Uh, I assume that he was referring to uh, this in a kind of comparative sense. Well, l let me clarify. Yes. He saw internal security in Pakistan as the major obstacle to attracting uh, foreign investment. I see. And he needed foreign investment in order to develop the economy. Uh, at no time did he ever consider uh, any other threat but India to be the existential threat against Pakistan. And, uh, and, and lest I become an apologist for President Musharraf, which I'm not, um, I, I think he, throughout the period that I met him, never, uh, although we hammered on him a, a number of times, never fully accepted um, that uh, that it was uh, in, not in Pakistan's interest to have a friendly government in in Afghanistan, ties to the Taliban as a um, as a hedge against an unfriendly government in Pakistan, meaning the uh, Northern Alliance with close ties to India. I see. Um, but he saw the, the rising militancy inside Pakistan as a threat to the internal security and stability of the country. As a, as a deterrent to foreign investment. Good. Um, when the support to Musharraf uh, essentially started pouring in, from the United States, um, although, as you explained, this was a reimbursement for the costs incurred by Pakistan in sending troops there. It was seen as U.S. alliance with one person uh, and one group, uh, the military, rather than with the people of Pakistan. In retrospect, uh, do you have doubts about that policy, or was it such a critical situation that it needed uh, this kind of an action? Well, um, policies are often, uh, in retrospect, we, we talk about them as if they're snapshots. Uh, when you're living them, uh, they really evolve. Uh, when I was there, and in February, when the Coalition Support Funding be Program began, it began uh, as just uh, a small program, uh, a few uh, tens of millions. Uh, it wasn't until uh, long after I'd left that the levels of this uh, got very, very, very high. Uh, and I was frankly shocked when to learn that it was as much as $100 million a month uh, 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 years later. Um, but uh, yes, I, I have gr tremendous criticism for our policies as they evolved uh, throughout the Bush administration. I think they became uh, very much skewed, uh, heavily, heavily assistance going heavily to the military and uh, only 10%, uh, very tiny percent, going to civilian programs. The civilian programs that I had suggested when I, in the short time I was an ambassador there, never really got fully funded and when they were funded well, they weren't funded uh, enough or effective enough. I, I had stressed education and uh, police uh, training. I felt that it was important as a security to develop uh, a, police, community policing, so that the people of Pakistan can feel safe in their communities. Also as a balance, a civilian policing is a balance to a uh, overly um, a powerful military. But this is not what happened. Uh, and uh, most of our assistance did go to the military, including in large weapon uh, systems, which I argued against. Were most of the projects that you thought were necessary uh, directed um, towards Fatah and the border region, or were they throughout Pakistan? Um, well, it was interesting. When we began the program, when we reestablished USAID in Pakistan in the summer of 2002, remember there had been a hiatus there uh, as it had been uh, cut off by the Pressler Amendment. We reestablished it. The British negotiated uh, a gentleman's deal with the with the American Embassy. They would provide education assistance and assistance to uh, Fatah and the North, where they had they claimed special ties, and we would concentrate our assistance on Baluchistan and Sindh. 
So our aid programs for education, for example, began in the SEND and in Baluchistan. And they only very feebly got started on uh, police training, uh, much to my later regret. Since you mentioned USAID, uh, let me just jump to, to that because uh, apart from your own experience with USAID as an, as an assistant administrator, um, you were also, I believe, involved in the transition in suggesting changes in the USAID system. Uh, many say that the USAID model is broken and there are those, including myself, who say that USAID is a very aptly named because much of the aid remains in the US. So. Uh, what do you think needs to be done in order to change this model? Uh, it, it appears from your own experience that uh, there were uh, fairly functioning parts of your own embassy, including the narcotics assistance section, that had been quite successful at the projects in which they took part, which involved the community. Uh, but why was it that USAID was not able to achieve success? Well, I'd, first of all, I'd agree with your analysis. I call USAID a failed state, <laughs> failed agency. Uh, the long history, and it does go back, um, is that uh, when John F. Kennedy first established uh, USAID in the 60s, it was it had 20,000 employees. It was robust. We had uh, uh, agronomists and educationalists and, and uh, engineers who were in the field delivering projects, working shoulder to shoulder with people uh, from the bottom up, projects that worked. Um, it was terrific uh, and was for a number of years. Uh, you hit the Vietnam War, you hit some of the problems in Latin America, um, AID became, in the view of Congress, politicized. Congress started to try to correct for that, uh, started to put restrictions on AID. Um, over the years, it, AID became a political football within Washington. Uh, its budget started getting cut. People and staff got, got getting cut. By the time you got to the, the uh, Bush administration, it was just savaged. Uh, budgets and, and personnel slashed year after year after year until now you have a hollow shell. People in AID are good, smart. Uh, they know what to do in development, but there's not enough of them. They cannot operate the way they had in the 60s by doing it themselves. So they've but they, but they say there can do in the spirit of, of the Peace Corps and AID, and they say yes to any challenge. But they've stretched themselves too thin. So to meet that yes to any challenge, they write contracts. Uh, and they write contracts to NGOs. And it's gotten to be lately they even write contracts to do the thinking to NGOs. They've, uh, this last administrator, Tobias, chopped off the head of AID by uh, shutting down the policy planning office uh, and by not requiring country directors to do strategic plans. Look, development is not about budget. Development is about planning, about thinking, uh, uh, about determine, setting your goals, monitoring to those goals, and then you get the budget. It's been flipped uh, today and tragically flipped. So. Uh, AID um, is not, does not have the capacity to do what we'd like it to do. I worry that it doesn't have the capacity to provide the uh, next two phases in the current uh, Malacan or SWAT uh, uh, crisis, which is to help with the security, meaning training police, and uh, reconstruction, uh, because we haven't funded it and we, it doesn't have the capacity to do it. Uh, so we've really shot ourselves in the foot with the demise. Demise. Now, I was very encouraged that uh, Secretary Clinton and President Obama came in saying all the right things, rebalancing development, diplomacy, and uh, um, defense, um, promised to build up AID, et cetera, et cetera. We still don't have an administrator. And we still have seem to be operating on the notion that all you need is somebody who's really smart and get Congress to give AID more people and more money. Uh-uh. It's not about people and money. It's about having the right plan, knowing what to do, uh, and how to do it. Then you get the money. Well, today Pakistan is facing two crises. One is an economic crisis that uh, President Zardari basically inherited because there was a global financial meltdown. 
so we can't blame him for for that. But Pakistan obviously suffered the effects of that, and he was trying. To, he and Prime Minister Gilani were trying to formulate policies to deal with it uh, when the militancy erupted out of the border region into the settled areas of Pakistan and the army had to be called into Swat and Malakand. So you just referred to the internally displaced people, uh, something like three million uh, out of uh, this area plus another 300,000 out of Bajor, uh, one of the northernmost agencies of Fatah. Uh, the government of Pakistan is very hard pressed in knowing what to do with this. Uh, but there is, it, it appears, a, a kind of a perfect storm in a positive sense in Washington, starting with President Obama, as you said, and then with Secretary Clinton, as well as on the Hill, a tremendous amount of uh, bipartisan support for aid to Pakistan in order to build it as part of this pairing of Afghanistan and Pakistan, because without a stable Pakistan, you can't have a stable Afghanistan. Um, the missing link in all of this is the ability of Pakistan itself. Even if this aid uh, somehow were to reach Pakistan, uh, all hundred cents of every dollar or eighty cents of every dollar, um, instead of the generally believed to be ten or twenty cents to the dollar, um, is Pakistan capable of making good use of it and how does one make sure that it does? Um, I think the answer is yes, Pakistan can make good use of it. Pakistanis are builders, you have construction companies, you know how to re rebuild schools, you know how to rebuild uh, electrical utilities, you know how to, how to drill wells for clean water. What you don't have in the private sector, a you know, great deal of capacity. In the, in the public sector, what you don't have uh, is the capacity to make those plans. Uh, in checking and preparation for today's meeting, uh, no one seems to be in the Pakistani government res thinking ahead to phase two and three in the current crisis. We're, there, we're transfixed on the first phase, which is clear the area of the insurgency. The military is going in, it's doing a job, it's doing a job rather destructively. Uh, it's going to leave a lot of destruction and rubble behind. Um, but uh, IDPs will not be able to return until they're safe, which means, uh, means really beefing up a police force and deploying a police force there to keep them safe after the insurgents are driven out. And then the third phase, which is to rebuild. That should be starting now, and it's not starting now. And frankly, uh, that kind of planning has, has not started now within the U.S. government either. There's no U.S. agency within the U.S. government that owns police training. Uh, AID was prohibited from uh, doing police training in the 1970s, uh, it's part of what I just mentioned. M uh, the military uh, moved into police training in Afghanistan and Iraq, which it should not have done, the way you you fight a war against an enemy and the way you protect people in their communities are completely different objectives. Um, Secretary Gates understands that, so the military is not the place for police training, nor is the State Department. Because State Departments are diplomats. They don't run programs. Uh, it, uh, Ambassador Dobbins, Jim Dobbins, of Rand Corporation, whose man I admire very much, has said repeatedly that it believes that this, this capacity ought to be developed in USAID. But USAID uh, it doesn't have uh, the funding or the people or the mandate, the legal mandate to do so. So, okay, now we face a, a crisis. We don't have the capacity within US government, yet we're facing this very crisis in uh, the Malakan, uh, where we need to be helping the Pakistanis immediately train and deploy police now. Uh, we need to be working with uh, Pakistanis to begin to move some funds, identify construction companies, move reconstruction uh, for, for rebuilding, doing feasibility studies now. And these two phases are, are nowhere near uh, engaged. That doesn't sound very uh, promising. But uh, it, it was quite uh, 
uh, heartening to, to note that uh, Ambassador Richard Holbrook, uh, who recently visited some of these camps, is now broadening his mandate, so to speak, to try and get some action on the Pakistan side, uh, and also to try and get assistance for Pakistan from the neighboring Muslim countries. But, but, but again, it's not about money. It's about uh, identifying what it is you need to do, setting your goals clearly, developing that strategic plan to accomplish those goals, monitoring that you're doing it, and then it's about money. I mean, you need money, of course, but we get hung up, if, you, if it's a State Department person in charge of it, and Holbrook is, uh, you start with the money and you end with the money, and, and I just think that uh, we need a new approach. Where will it come from? If the Pakistanis are not doing it, the United States is not doing it, where will it come from? Well, uh, we're having this conversation. Uh, you can betcha I'll be saying these very same things to Holbrook, who's just returned. Um, uh, we need to develop that kind of uh, planning capability uh, to help Pakistan. We need to, to do that now, but that's where we need to start. Um, where do you see this developing if the government does not plan for rehabilitation and reconstruction? Uh, do you see the possibility of uh, this tremendous upsurge of civil support for the fight against militancy turning against the government? And if so, uh, would it threaten the, the government? Yes, I think, I think uh, your question contains some very important points. Uh, it's, it's extremely important to note that uh, the uh, extremists do not have the support of the population. I believe that they didn't uh, and never have. Um, I think if you go back and look at the history of the Malakan and Swat Valley, uh, the, these are people who are, are uh, follow Sufi uh, religion, much more gentle. They feel imposed upon by these extremists. They, in the free and fair election of February 2008, they voted the religious parties out and voted in a secular Pushtun party, the uh, Awami National uh, Party. Uh, and they voted with their feet again when the uh, extremists started, started to um, pressure them uh, earlier this year. Even before the military moved in, a half a million people had already fled. Uh, when the rest of Pakistan began to, to see the harsh nature of the extremists there and that their ambitions were not limited locally but extended to uh, throughout Pakistan in replacing the civilian government and imposing their version of uh, harsh Sharia jur jurisdictional and administrative law uh, throughout Pakistan and when they saw on their television sets and computer sets, uh, big bearded men getting real pleasure out of whipping the, the bottom of a little 15-year-old girl and saw that this was not, not religion, but uh, kind of a, a purient brutality, that the Pakistan people reacted in great solidarity and in support of their army going in. In mid-May, the all parties uh, got together and supported the military operation. Uh, also in mid-May, uh, the Ulma, the religious leaders, uh, met throughout Pakistan and supported the military operation, uh, condemned, uh, put a fatwa, issued a fatwa against beheading and uh, this harsh brand of, of Sharia that had nothing to do with their religion. Um, and there was great solidarity. Uh, your question, and now I'll come to it, is will this last uh, if no assistance is, is being administered to the now three million people who've left? No, it won't. It's very fickle. It's 120 degrees out there. Uh, only 200,000 are in camps. The rest are in homes. They're not getting assistance. They're a burden on, on uh, the families that they're staying with. If they cannot go home because they're insecure and uh, there's no clean water and no electricity, and they can't stay where they are, they're going to start to blame the government instead of 
the extremists. Right now they're blaming extremists, but this will flip. And that is why I urge urgency. It appears uh, from your description and from other commentaries uh, on Pakistan that the political leadership, whether it's on the government or the provincial level, uh, is missing in action in terms of coming up with an adequate strategy. Mm -hmm. But the, the silver lining, if one can call it that, out of all this trouble in the last couple of years in Pakistan has been the rise of civil society. Uh, would you care to, to comment on that, on, on how the new media and civil society are now playing a greater role and therefore acting as a, a check and a balance on runaway government? Well, I, uh, with regards to delivering assistance, uh, in this crisis. I have a couple of comments. One, this is a real crisis. This is the largest movement of Pakistani people in the history of Pakistan, in, including partition. And it's the fastest. People came out very quickly. And they're not in camps so you can't register them. And if you can't register them, you don't know who they are so you can't deliver assistance. So this is a real humanitarian crisis. But civil society, in fact, and frankly the government and the, and the army, has had a trial run. Uh, the earthquake assistance gave experience. The very man who ran, who was in the army then, General Na uh, mm -hmm. Nadim, um, has been appointed now as a retired officer uh, running the special support uh, unit. So there is some experience and civil society and NGOs have experience with this. Um, they are finding, however, that uh, people aren't reaching into their pockets right now. It's a, it's a um, slow down everywhere. So the money isn't quite there. But there are more institutions and frameworks that are, are in place, including with the civilian government uh, in registering uh, uh, people with biometrics and assuring that people aren't, there's no duplicity in the way uh, aid is administered and new ideas such as cash payments. They've just started this week um, to provide uh, uh, 2,500 rupees per family one-time payment. They have to find them, people have to be registered, but this one-time payment will, uh, by the Pakistan government, will alleviate uh, some of the uh, burden that uh, families are imposing on uh, their hosts. Thank you, Ambassador. Um, I'm sure that this conversation could have gone on for much longer, mm -hmm. but we do have an audience and we want to bring them into this. Uh, but just so that you don't feel bad that your earlier suggestions uh, were not taken about increasing the police force, just this last week the government of Pakistan actually has talked about uh, re-inducting retired servicemen into the police force in Swat and Malakan. So that will kind of jump start the process. We hope that this kind of thinking, out of the box thinking, uh, persists in Pakistan. But for more out-of-the-box thinking, I'll have to go to our audience. So uh, we in invite questions. Please uh, remember to, to stand uh, when you get the mic. Please introduce yourself, and uh, then uh, we will take your question. Um, I can speak. Thank you so much, Ambassador. My name is Suleiman Wasti formerly with the Planning Commission of Pakistan. Uh, we go back to the Laos days in Bantian. And um, my question relates to the accountability for civilian and military assistance. Shuja knows more about military as assistance, but in terms of the, your tenure in USAID, I just recently came across a solicitation for strengthening justice for Pakistan. So with my contacts in Pakistan, I talked to the media, the GOTV, and uh, the Supreme Court Bar Association, and everybody was shocked. I mean, they just had a lawyer's movement, and nobody was consulted in terms of I mean, planning and needs assessment. So I, I tend to agree with you. I was just trying to bolster what your initial reaction mm -hmm. was. Any comments? Yes, I have a comment on that, because I totally agree with you. Uh, I, you know, frankly, uh, the staff at USAID is, has so shrunk, you, you hardly have time to, to eat lunch uh, in a day that's 12 hours long. So uh, long consultations and long meetings and hammering out ideas is a real luxury. 
there is something that civil society can do. And Asuja and I are both in civil society. We both represent uh, two different think tanks. Um, we can develop ideas and provide them to AID and the State Department. Uh, what I'm doing right now at the um, at Middle East Institute, and Asuja is a part of it, we have formed a Center for Pakistan Studies. Now, part of this center will be to set up a, a, uh, a forum, a virtual forum on the computer where people like yourself, uh, retired Pakistanis from the World Bank, from IMF, from the Planning Commission, uh, Pakistanis in Pakistan, Pakistanis in NGOs, Pakistani government officials, Pakistani Americans, um, uh, anybody who's interested um, can, can join this forum post comments, write papers, comment on papers, hammer out ideas, and then with our co contacts, we will provide them to Richard Holbrook, to AID, to uh, the State Department. It it's, it's, uh, may sound simple in its conception, but what it is is out of the box. It's revolutionary in the sense that uh, it is a window, it's a channel for people who are, in, people who are not in the U.S. government who have ideas to get them to people in the U.S. government. And we will provide that service shortly. I've just hired a young webmaster, uh, a Pakistani, who graduated from the University of Lahore with a master's degree in IT, uh, to set this up. Uh, so we'll be off and running shortly. We have another question. Good afternoon, Ambassador. Thanks for coming and talking to us. My name is Omar Malik. I'm a management consultant. Um, I have two questions for you. First question is uh, regarding the press coverage that Pakistan gets in the U.S. press. Frankly, it's extremely unfair. Um, not just my opinion, it's just across the board. It's very negative. Pakistan is failing. The Taliban are coming. It seems like the U.S. analytical community almost wants Pakistan to fail. And everybody in Pakistan believes that, too. Uh, my second question is, these problems that Pakistan are facing are not in isolation. Tim Dobbins, your friend, came here at this forum a few weeks ago or a few months ago, and I asked him this question too, and he did not answer it satisfactory. He blamed Pakistan for all the problems that were going on in Afghanistan at that time. And I said that the government in Afghanistan, President Hamid Karzai is the president of a few neighborhoods of Kabul. His brother is involved in drug smuggling, very well established right now. Afghanistan is a narco state. The United States has no human intelligence in Afghanistan. Other than running bombing missions with airplanes, they're not doing anything else over there, or they're not capable of at this point. The United States has spent $143 billion in Afghanistan. Um, so the problem really starts and ends in Afghanistan. Um, your, your comments. Well, thank you. Uh, the, the same view is actually held in, in FLIP. Uh, I've heard uh, many high-ranking Pakistani officials say, look, our problems in Pakistan are coming from Afghanistan. And you, the United States, started that uh, when you worked uh, with us, but in Afghanistan, to evict the Soviets. And from that moment on, that was the beginning of all the problems. So there's a lot of, it, this goes back and forth. I think what you're describing is what it now has a name. It's called the trust deficit. Nobody, nobody trusts everybody. Everybody throws these barbs back and forth. I think the trust de deficit, not understanding each other, is a problem in itself. Uh, and uh, I, I do agree with you that uh, the American press um, gets a certain couple of refrains that it keeps repeating. And getting a deeper discussion is really hard I, on Pakistan. But I think that's true on everything. I think the, the written um, uh, journalism is collapsed, industry is collapsing in the United States, and cable news doesn't do what they used to do with packages where they actually uh, research uh, an issue and, and provide some information on it to educate the public. Instead, they just bring in a bunch of talking heads to shout at each other. I, you can't get any information. It's very difficult to get it off of cable news today. Uh, so I think uh, it's, a, it's a kind of an industry problem uh, with news that you identify. But it's also true in Pakistan. Now, we're all thrilled that uh, President Musharraf opened up the airways to uh, f uh, privately owned 
uh, channels in Pakistan uh, and that the number of newspapers increased and there was, was greater journalistic coverage. But I have to tell you that if you start to look in Pakistan as to who, what, what industry, what sector is behind and stoking up the anti-Americanism in Pakistan, the answer is not the extremists. The answer is the media, the free media. Uh, and uh, the Pakistan media is just as guilty of trying to increase its circulation by pumping out anti-American stuff as the American media is guilty of uh, being, uh, I'd say, lazy in trying to understand uh, some of the deeper, very complex issues of Pakistan. I would call this the breaking news syndrome because they're <laughs> constantly running those tickers across the bottom of the screen and competing with each other to try yeah. and, and see who gets the news out first, even if it's wrong or incomplete or partial mm -hmm. or whatever. Uh, the other issue I think is worth pointing out that the Pakistan media, uh, after uh, General Musharraf opened the doors to uh, participation, uh, produced something like 62 channels. And uh, for a market of 175 million, that's uh, probably 50 too many. Uh, so there's going to be some market clearing uh, systems uh, that will take, you know, normal economics will take over, like the US media, uh, that perhaps uh, some quality will, will triumph. Uh, let me see if we have any other questions. Uh, please wait for the microphone. Yes, uh, Ambassador, my name is Christy McCampbell. I was formerly with the State Department in INL, which is International Narcotics and Law Enforcement Affairs. And um, you uh, made a comment that there was no, um, really, nobody has ownership of the police training there. And I was wondering, who, who do you recommend or who do you think would be a, a, a good um, training program? Who could own that? Well, um, thank you for that question, Christy. I, uh, before I went left to go become ambassador to Pakistan, I was the principal deputy assistant secretary in INL. And I was in charge of um, the police, the police office there. Uh, the closest thing we have in the U.S. government for running police training uh, is INL. But even when I managed it, I wasn't happy with the way it was done. It was done as a training exercise. We would get funding from uh, the government, from uh, OMB, and we would divide it up, portion to DEA, portion to FBI, portion to Treasury, and they would send five experts to stay in a five-star hotel for five days and train 25 officers or whatever, uh, who would then, when they'd go back to their corrupt precincts, or, or so they would fall right back into the same um, patterns of behavior. It wasn't it wasn't as I keep coming back, and I'll say it again, the way you should do development, which is think about it. What is it that you want to accomplish? Develop a long-term strategic plan on how to get there. M set your benchmarks and monitor for success. Not just one year or three months or six months training programs. Um, and uh, uh, right now, INL doesn't have the capacity to do that. When it's given a great big job to do, uh, as in um, uh, Bosnia or Kosovo or Iraq or Afghanistan, it does what AID does. It contracts out to great big companies like DynCorp. And uh, uh, we're still not there yet. Uh, what you've asked for, we don't have yet within the U.S. government, but we better get it quick. And I'm. I, and we've been saying this for several years. People who've written very eloquently on it are Mark Schneider from uh, International Crisis. Um, uh, the folks over at USAIP have done some really good studies on it. Now it's time to do it. Ambassador, most of the experience with counterinsurgency indicates that it's not won by the military but by the police. Even uh, the Indian experience in the Northeast mm -hmm. in particular establishes that. Now, you, you said that the U.S. doesn't have the capacity. Wouldn't this be something where the European allies could be brought in? Because they certainly have some experience with police training, and they have interior ministries. They're worse than we are. 
Uh, if you if you if you go back and review the history of Afghanistan, for example, and the bond uh, talks, where they had this funny notion that we would uh, uh, parcel out ministries in Afghanistan to different countries and they would be responsible for, for developing that ministry. I think uh, we, the United States got uh, diplomacy in the army, but uh, uh, Germany got the police. Uh, Japan, no, Italy got uh, the courts. The Brits got counter-narcotics. <laughs> and and uh, under British uh, control of counter-narcotics, uh, Afghanistan went from uh, uh, zero to 93 percent of the world's production. Uh, I, I, so but, they were good at it. But the police training, the, the Germans uh, didn't fund it, didn't do the job. And after several years, the United States did move in, did do it. Again, the military, I and I helped a bit, but we, but because there was a vacuum there. So uh, I'm, I'm, if I sound a little critical of our allies, well, yeah, you know what I am. But the U.S. also got the Interior Ministry, with which it had very little experience, yeah. institutionally. Well, we haven't, uh, we, we didn't have uh, yes. much experience with nation building. <coughs> and this was an administration that came in saying it would never do it, and then uh, ended up uh, having to do it, but didn't know how and didn't stop and spend the time to think about how to do it. I noticed in your response uh, to, to the earlier question, uh, about aid and you know, how it, it's designed. Uh, would it uh, was it inadvertent that you didn't talk about talking to the people that are likely to be affected as a first step in the in the formulation of the strategies? Uh, because oh, that seems to be missing. Yeah, no, no, it's not. Wasn't inadvertent. I, I do think that that's important. To, I do think that uh, what we're trying to do with the Middle East Institute and establishing this uh, forum where people can join it. And I, in a, in implicit in your question is uh, a principle that I very firmly believe, and that is that the be be best designed aid pro uh, projects are from the bottom up and not the top down. For example, there's a aid uh, project in uh, Pakistan, $30 million, through the Ministry of Education to design a uh, testing system to test high schools to see whether they're up to standards or not. Well, I, I, I maintain that there's not a single Pakistani mother who thinks that that's helped their kid learn something. It's invisible. Uh, and it's been all in Islamabad, all at the ministry, all lost on bureaucracy to, to bureaucrats. And that's not what I would call a well-designed project. Well. Uh, we hate to, to end on a pessimistic note, but uh, we're delighted that you shared so many insights and uh, some of the details, particularly uh, at, uh, where all of this began, the, the current crisis in Pakistan and Afghanistan uh, in the post 9-11 period. And I'm sure that uh, people will be listening and watching uh, your talk with great interest because of that and because of all your suggestions. Uh, Ambassador Chamberlain, on behalf of the Rumi Forum, I'd like to thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you.